Welcome everyone. We're on our on our the downhill slide. So the last couple of days of the of the conference, the rest of the day and tomorrow. I'm excited to have you here. We have the UAS special interest group and Casey Green and Chuck Powell are going to talk to us for this session. They're going to give a highlight and some details on what the work group has been up to. And then Chuck is going to entertain us all with lessons learned. Again, we love that session. So I'm going to pass it off. Casey, do you want to join me? Share your screen. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, we're so glad to be here and uh, talk about what we've done thus far for 2021. Uh, Chuck and I are excited and really thrilled about what we've done the UAS work. So that said, um, I'm going to pass it to my my partner in crime, Chuck. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. So like Casey said, uh, we're going to review this last year, and I think this was the best year I've been involved with this group. We got a lot accomplished um, in a very short period of time. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Casey, can you hit the next slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you go back one? Yep. So our mission, um, the Unmanned Aircraft System Work Group works to help organizations and individuals to incorporate our contract for UAS services, as well as identify or develop educational resources, um, develop guidelines for using UAS for geospatial data collection, and post-processing to produce relevant data sets. And our last two fly-ins uh, were great examples of, of, of those useful guidelines that we've shared or, or, or had other groups um, share with us. Um, UAS compliance with the FAA and other requirements. We've had, um, in previous years, we had many um, topics on this and including um, presentations at um, previous um, conferences and identify or develop education materials, seminars, and other opportunities. And that's what was so exciting these last two years for us is our fly-in. Um, um, this last year was our, our in-person um, hybrid event, and it went out great. And Casey's going to show the highlight film of that um, coming up. Go ahead and do the next slide. Like any, any of the groups at AJEC, what makes AJEC special is the people, the community. Um, and I am so proud of this community um, and uh, especially the UAS community. We're from all walks of life, all, all sectors, um, private, state. And these are just the numbers of people who, who have, um, are members, voting members and public at large that attended since January of this year. Um, state and private uh, make up about 50%. Um, to the rest, we have county, tribal, um, trade associations, um, military, law enforcement, federal governments, um, education, county and city. Um, so I'm very proud of that fact that we're a very diverse group and, and it's great to get everyone's perspective. Go ahead and do the next slide, Casey. Where where are we? Where did where do we live and work? Go ahead and click one more time, Casey. Um, so we we covering most of the state. Um, we'd love to fill in those few counties. Um, I think we're just over fifty percent of the counties. Um, so we'd love to get the last um, I think seven counties um, involved. So um, if you're out there. In these counties, we would love to have you, or even if you're in one of the, the shaded counties, we would love to have you add to our group. Um, we're a really great group, and um, we have um, some interesting topics um, every other month, and then our, our the other month, we're trying to uh, work on our, our mission, so our geo, our, our landing page on um, AZGO, um, our outreach, and um, getting content up on the, the landing page. So we'd love to have anyone join us. Um, and definitely we want everyone that has supported us this last year to continue supporting us and, and work with us. Go ahead and do the next slide. One more click, Casey. So these are all the organizations that have um, 
attended our meetings this last year or since January, I'm sorry. Um, and hopefully I didn't miss anyone that, um, as you can see, we're a very diverse group, not just the, the sectors we're in, but, uh, of the organizations that we're part of. And we have to give thanks to these organizations. They allow us the time um, to volunteer. Um, so without them, uh, we wouldn't, AJEC wouldn't be who they are. Um, so we should give a thank to all the organizations that have supported us um, these last couple of years, and especially this year. Our, our, first, our goal in our, in our work plan is um, USA, U, I'm sorry, UAS technology information and exchange and best practices. Um, develop and maintain a, a UAS section on the AJEC website, which we are, correct me if I'm wrong, glad to announce that our landing page on AZGO is live. Correct, Casey? That is correct. Perfect. So we worked really hard. Um, we have to give a shout out to Casey and Tony and Jenna um, to help develop and um, put the, get that up and run. Um, like I said, is, uh, these are all the, all the volunteers are using their own time um, and, and supporting this. And it does take extra effort to get, get these um, platforms up and running and these goals out there completed. Um, so on that web page, we're trying to put all our um, documentation, our, our goals of best practices, guidelines, and so forth on there. Um, so we're trying to get that up on the landing page. Um, we would love for you to go out and after uh, Casey um, demos it, you know, come out, look at it, and get back to us and see what you would like added um, to that, that landing page. Um, We'd like to work with other UAS experts um, about solutions and best practices and examples of projects. Um, we strive really hard not to put sales pitches out there. Um, um, we try to do the best practices or lessons learned and, and we really focus on that. So all our presentations this past year, I really, I've learned so much from them and I hope everyone else has learned that um, you're not going to be sold something. You're going to see and see how people completed their projects or what tools they're using to, to come up with that solution. Um, so um, the presentations have been great, the fly-in and our, our monthly top or our bi-monthly um, meetings on that. Um, identify and coordinate potential programs and issues that might affect the Arizona ge geospatial community. Um, so, you know, we try to look at the whole community and, 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 and um, try to talk about the whole community, not just the cool drones, the, the, the widgets behind it, the, actually the software and the processing to get that solution for all end users. Coordinate UAS educational opportunities. You know, um, we've been really focusing on um, getting these education um, seminars and, and presentations out to the UAS community. Um, but we also want to start outreaching to um, public schools and, and um, K through 12 schools and, and start introducing GIS and UAS to, to those schools and the students. Um, develop a UAS lunch and learn program. We, we've, we, we have our, you know, every other meeting, we have our, our presentations and our topics and so forth. Um, and then we've kind of transitioned to more of a, a larger fly-in um, yearly event. So um, we're still trying to get as much um, education and much exposure out there um, throughout the year. And then um, also work with other committees within AJIC uh, and work groups. You know, our outreach, you know, maybe we can support um, another work groups um, outreach to K through 12 or to their their attended community with um, the use of UAS as a, as a tool for showing that. Go ahead and do the next slide, Casey. It's all yours, Casey. All right. So um, this is a screenshot of our 
UAS work group community on a, a, AZ, um, AZGO. Uh, I'm going to do a live demo, so pull that up and bring it over. And so right here is the AZGO community page. And so to get to the UAS launch page or community, you just want to scroll down and just look at the other communities. I encourage you to check out. Uh, and if you go to AJIC UAS Workgroup, you can just say hit explore and it should take you to the AJIC UAS Workgroup. And so what we really wanted um, with this site is to make it interactive. We wanted to informative and we, we just see this thing, this site as being organic and living. So we definitely want to um, people to check back on it, look at our calendar. Um, as you can see, we have dates and uh, our goal is to keep this as current as possible. Uh, of course, here's our SIG right here that's showing up on the calendar and we have um, other dates um, uh, with other events pertaining to UAS outside of AJIC. It's not just AJIC. It's um, um, events from our um, members, uh, from the from people that's in our group. And the great thing, like Chuck said, it's, it's not just government, it's, you know, private industry, you know, it's, it's uh, well, state government, um, national government. So it, it's a lot of people coming from different sectors, which make our, our uh, efforts um, to learn and grow uh, even even better. Um, so, of course, our mission is up front. We have our calendar, and we have uh, uh, YouTube videos. <laughs> how to apply for a drone waiver? Hey, if you're going to uh, use drones uh, in your GIS projects or fly missions, you got to know how to do that kind of stuff. So, we want to to add it there. Uh, if you scroll down, we just have a cool little um, story map on our, our feature flights. You know, so I, I de definitely encourage you to come check this out. On page two, we kind of broke our launch page up into sections. Um, and the first section is getting uh, guidelines and best practices. Um, we know that if you're new to um, UAS and, and using drones and um, GIS, that you're going to have to have a place to start. And that's what this page is all about. You know, just get you started. Let's uh, go over some guidelines. Here are some, some curated documents that you can um, go to to help you along your way. We have a link to the FAA um, where um, the before, so you can access the Before You Fly app, something that you're definitely going to want to do. Um, and it's going to help you once you say get started and get some basic things out, out the way. And these um, documents have been curated by you know, experts in the field that's on the committee. Second, uh, the third tab is resources. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is not only are people looking at how to fire, what we're looking for resources. Um, right here is a, you can search UAS resources here in open data. So people who flown or UAS content, you can go here and uh, like the AJIC search, uh, like a geo search, you can find data documents and apps uh, right at your fingertips. Uh, the second thing on this page is statewide UAS project. This is an app that we create so people can come to our launch page and document what they've flown and share it with the overall community. community. Um, one of the purposes of this, first of all, to share data eventually. Eventually, we see this launch page as a as a warehouse for UAS flight data. So people won't uh, have to fly the same area. If someone has already flown and if their parameters are, are, are correct, um, that same data can be used for someone else. And the uh, experience builder uh, application will help people document. So we're really excited about that. Um, you go here, fill out the form um, and you can, um, Draw a polygon of the, of the area that you're flying in. It's showing the map, and the community now is aware of uh, the work you're doing uh, with uh, UAS. And then also connected by drone, if you wanted to add their site, we have some people that volunteer with this organization. And so it's 
this year. They have, have a, a lot of um, a lot of information. They're uh, in partnership with the FAA, so uh, we there's a lot of resources and events and training that we want people to be aware of. So we have that to our resources. Our last page is training. Um, training is just so important um, when flying in. Um, on here we have the U our, our UAS uh, flying one. We have, uh, it's only been two of them, we have them both here and uh, links to presentations um, that we had on the flying end. So um, I, I'm gonna talk about that later on, but I wanted to add this in here because you can always go back and just learn about what we, what we did and perhaps it'll motivate you to come next year to our uh, next flying end. But we also have a library page with some more resources and um, So Chuck, I'm gonna hand it back to you so you can talk about uh, our goal number two. Yep. Chuck? I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, yes. So our goal two is education and training symposium. So we're here. Um, I, I love this conference. Um, it's one of the best, if not the best, um, conference I've attended. Um, we shout out to the conference committee. Um, they do a great job. Um, so it's such a highlight of our year. Um, but we also want to um, um, get that education throughout the year. So um, we love that. Um, this is our, I think, third year with the special interest group track. Um, or it might be even the fourth year where we had a, a, a pre-conference half day um, match with the LIDAR work group uh, one year. And then we've had the um, hour, um, two one hour sessions um, since then. Um, our still, our, our focus is on geospatial output um, from UAS. Um, so we're, we're still the GIS component of UAS. So, um, all our presentations try to have that GIS um, functionality in there. Um, and we've worked really hard to get presenters. Um, Jenna reached out this year and, and got um, Esri and I believe Sunt um, to present um, um, our workshops and our demonstrations throughout the year. And, and, and it's a total team effort. Um, you hear Casey in my voice all the time, but it is a total team effort. The whole um, UAS work group is, is tremendous and, and volunteering their time and getting things accomplished in a very short, short period of time. Um, we work with um, the conference committee to make sure we fill and advertise our, our special interest group. Um, and then um, we're trying to look for additional opportunities outside of the symposium. Um, we, had, we have a tradition and um, tradition of the um, fly-in now. I, I think, I think um, we are going to keep that going. Uh, I would hope we do. I think they've been both very successful. Um, and hopefully um, next year, again, we'll have an in-person, um, like completely in-person, somewhere where the whole work group and the whole UAS GIS community can get together. Go ahead and do the next slide, Casey. It's all yours again, Casey. <laughs> okay, the flying in week cap. Uh, once again, this was held November 15th um, down in Tucson um, at Westland Resources. Uh, it, they were a great host. Can't take, thank uh, Chuck and Westland enough um, for having it there. It was a beautiful day. Um, and we just had a really solid event. It was really, Great, a lot of learning. We focus on multi-spectral and hyperspectral data collection and, and uses, and it was sponsored by uh, Brian, uh, Brian Cole Machineries. So I'm not going to go over the whole <laughs> conference; we didn't have time. But I just kind of wanted to show here some pictures from the slideshow. Uh, I mean, um, pictures that I added to the slideshow to, so you can see the kind of stuff we were doing um, down in Tucson. Um, 
we got some great UAS uh, demonstration. Um, this one, uh, the one pictured here, was the first time I've seen seen one, but it's the Wing Search 2. Uh, it's a vertical and uh, take off and landing fixed wing drone, um, which uh, really is just phenomenal because it maximizes your uh, flight time um, with vertical and um, takeoff capabilities, which is a game changer in my opinion. Um, so the mission demonstrations, we we also, like I said, we had the Wingster One um, um, uh, vertical takeoff landing fixed wing drone, and that's great. But we also had um, the DJI M600 drone with LiDAR camera payload, which is amazing. Uh, <laughs> the fact that now that you can get a, a small UAS with a LiDAR camera on it really blows my mind. And um, they demonstrated this. And um, it also had the base station, precision, um, GNSS um, mobile uh, positioning. So, I mean, it was just awesome. I'm bad, I'm bad. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chuck. Sorry, sorry Casey. I was going to um, just want to state that this demonstration with the M600 was JTED, which is a local high school. And, and Levi is teaching this to high school students. You, and they're using these tools in high school. I, yeah, that is so, uh, the excitement in my voice just to hear that because, you know, he's trained up the, the future in UAS, so that's awesome. Um, bad Elf, uh, uh, we had a Bad Elf precision control point positioning. I, I know Chuck uses this uh, probably every time he goes out, but it's just a great device for um, um, getting your control points, which are so important when you're um, flying a UAS mission. Half the day was pretty much us witnessing these um, technologies out in the field. So that's what makes it so special because you're out, you're hands on with the equipment and you're, you're getting firsthand um, knowledge of how uh, people are using uh, these, uh, this UAS uh, equipment and also um, your control point equipment also. So the presentations, um, the first bad elf, a presentation um, was we, was getting control of your ground control, and um, we went over planning and preparation, um, GCPs, and, and working with the GNSs. It was uh, um, definitely a, a great presentation. Just so, so it was full of a wealth of knowledge of how to properly set those ground control points. Um, the Wingstra uh, Gen Two product review, of course. And then we actually um, had a presentation by Green Zone um, to cover the processing of multispectral data. And um, their project was on vegetation mapping on the Lower Salt River, uh, it's a re restoration project. So we were able to pretty much, our conference focus on your mission from start to finish, ground control point. That's pre-flight, flying an actual UAS and then processing it um, so you can use the data for, for, your, for whatever uh, project you're working on. So some highlights of uh, getting your ground control points, lessons learned, it was uh, GNSS orientation, securing GCP targets, check your data, uh, capture while on site, timing those, uh, whether your two clients are too low, I mean, are you, if you're too low or too high, um, just remember faster is always better. Image and image quality uh, is, is really important. And um, high contrast target while you're uh, taking those, uh, those pictures. For uh, processing multi-spectral data, um, there were some things that to, to consider. Um, this one of the slides, but I will kind of want to go uh, over it because I think it's important to pass on the project included, um, the project size, the scope of your project, what UAS platform meets your needs. Sometimes um, you only need a fixed one. Sometimes you need a, uh, a, a multi-rotor uh, UAS, but they really did a good job of covering those things. Spatial and temporal resolution and your software, all this, you know, it makes one software, there's not one software that may work for you, you may need a couple of them. And they went over 
64D, which is one of the uh, leading uh, industry standards, Agisoft and Zona Map, um, computer processing, things that you need to consider because this is big data, you know? So you're gonna need a lot of processing power to uh, process imagery. Um, also, because it's big data, you're gonna need data storage. And they did a really good job of covering data storage uh, for the project. And so this is only a snack. <laughs> if you wanna see the, the whole project, go ahead and go to our uh, launch page on AZGO, our community, and you can um, see the slideshow and um, there's links uh, to the to some of the presentations. So uh, thank you for our, for listening. Uh, Chuck and I are all here to, to answer any questions. We have our email addresses on the screen, and we also have the um, so the website to the launch page. And we're welcoming more committee and more of the merrier. Um, we we believe that um, all can add to the body of knowledge. So um, Chuck, do you have anything else further to add on? Oh, I think you stated it perfectly, Casey. Um, we hope to see you next Wednesday at our next meeting. That was awesome, guys. So there are some questions. Um, one of them I took the liberty and answered in the chat for you. Uh, one was about the wing trap and who who was the folks that demoed that. Um, so I shared that it was Bronco Machinery and, and his friends. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, Jenna. Um, Darling, um, Darling Geomatics. Um, it was theirs that did the live demo. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, Darling, Darling has um, a wing track here in Tucson. Thanks for that correction, Chuck. That's excellent. No problem. Um, so we've got a couple more questions for you, for you both. Uh, Tom Homan was wondering if there would be an option to drop a KML that might be used for DGI planning or for flight limits on the, on the UAS hub site, on the map for that? Uh, eventually, yes, we're trying to figure that out, um, how we're gonna present that, uh, but we definitely, that's not the first time we've heard that. Um, so look in the future of us doing that also. Awesome. Um, the other question that came in, Larry Prentice asked, do you guys have Lance information on the UAS page? Um, if not, it would be really cool to see what current Lance applications are active and accessible. For instance, AirMap recently went down. So it would be great to be able to share that. Um, Casey, you can add to this that uh, we do have the before you fly links. Um, and I would caution everyone to go to that source as, as that is FAA's um, site and there it's, um, it's, it, it's their data. So um, that should be the, um, the latest and greatest. Um, but uh, if there's additional layers uh, we can add to our our map, we would love to add those and look at all options. Um, but I would still um, caution everyone to always check before you fly, because um, that's an authoritative um, site for um, airspace. Yeah, um, and if I could I put this back on the screen, if you, on here, if you just go here and use this, it does have um, the land, and you just should be able to see it on my screen, I'm still sharing. Um, Right there. So if you can, there is a link where you can get before you fly it. You can have a link information. So I hope that helps. But hey, uh, I, I, Larry, uh, you're more than welcome to come to our group if you're really interested in it. Definitely love to have. You. Thanks guys, it looks like we're in good shape. So Chuck, I think you get to take it away. Okay, sounds good. You wanna share my screen? I'll stop sharing mine. Can you stop sharing? There you okay. go. 
2021 was a big year for me. Um, year four of our drone program in review. Same places, different faces. We've had some big changes at Westland. Um, we just opened an office in Washington and Oregon, and we purchased an um, environmental consulting firm out of Reno, Nevada. Um, in the same year, we've reorganized Geomatics. Uh, at one point, um, GIS, UAS, and um, Survey was under one um, group, under one director. Um, they have now since moved um, Survey under engineering, and um, UAS has um, transitioned into GIS. Um, and uh, GIS is its own department with a new director. That affected me um, and my group. Uh, we had, so at the beginning, um, at the middle of uh, 2020, uh, we had a grand total of five um, Part 107 pilots. Um, since then, our chief pilot, uh, Jack Taylor, uh, I'm sure everyone knows him. Uh, he's presented with me uh, every year um, since we've had our program. Um, moved to Boston to become a rocket scientist, use his aeronautical engineering um, degree. Um, it's a dream job. He's working with satellites at a government think tank. Um, so he's, he, he's very happy and I'm very happy for him. Um, one pilot moved out of survey into another department. Um, um, that's, he's no longer flying. Um, and one of our pilots was promoted to GIS director, not a um, Reynolds. Um, so uh, we are down to two pilots um, as of right now. It's still the same amount of work. Um, so we're a little busy. We have environmental, cultural resources, engineering, and now we were all in Arizona. Now we're in Oregon, Washington, Nevada as well. So um, our, our Westland footprint is expanding. Uh, across all sectors and now and, and geographically as well. Let's look back at our ground pain. And this can't be a Western presentation without a video of me crashing. Um, Casey, um, I think this is Casey's highlights. Um, so um, I have not had a spectacular crash like this in a while. Um, so, and yes, that's me throwing the cumulus. Um, this year, um, we try to navigate the FAA regulations. We were new to it and our group, our company was very new to it. Um, so communicating where and when and how we can fly to project managers was a big hurdle for us. Um, and we're still learning a little bit in that and, and still um, learning how to talk to our project managers and our external clients. Um, software selection technology is still changing. And, 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 and at the beginning, we were trying to figure out what software did we want to use, cloud-based versus in-house and, and so forth, or a combination of those both. Um, managing our flight areas. How, how, how can we um, fly this project? How many flights would it take? What aircraft to use and so forth? Control. And this is a hot topic. How many GCP, how many ground control points do you, you need? Well, it depends on when you're deliverable and what, what, what are you producing? Are you producing an electronic um, model um, to be used on a web? Or are you presenting a, a surface for an engineer? Are you presenting a paper map? Um, there's a lot of things that go into that. So um, we've learned quite a bit. Um, but each project area is a little different and we have to relearn and, 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 and take new things into account. Second year, um, uh, a better checklist. Um, you know, our checklists, we consider them living documents um, where they change over time. Um, when a new incident or a new problem arises, um, we want to make sure we're accounted for that and prepare for that. Um, so we adjust our checklist. Um, 
as you can tell, um, sometimes we need more practice throws or more, um, more training and more real life situations um, when uh, uh, we're doing it. At this time, we needed a more durable aircraft. That, that aircraft that you saw in the video um, was carbon fiber. Um, carbon fiber does not bounce. Um, so, um, you know, we, at this time, this was um, year two, we were looking, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, year two, we were looking at different um, aircraft. Um, uh, the big thing we learned um, from our first fixed wing to our second fixed wing is the flight software. You know, make sure you look at all aspects of an aircraft, um, not just, you know, the specs of the aircraft, how far it can fly, how high it can go, um, battery life, storage capacity, um, sensors. But how easy is it to use um, in actual field environments? Um, is your screen sufficient to work in bright sunlight? Um, does your aircraft have requirements that might not be well suited for Arizona? Um, we have a lot of sun, a lot of heat. You know, think about all that. It's a, a complete package. Um, we found out faster turnaround. If you can get the aircraft back up faster, it, it, it's more efficient for us at Westland than longer flights. Um, so look at that. What is the procedure? What is the pre-flight procedure? What is the, um, you know, um, requirements to load missions? Can you preload them all the mission blocks or do you have to um, clear it and then uh, move and then add another one? Weather limitations, you know, we're always fighting that sun here in Arizona, that heat um, in the summer, your, your window to fly is very, is, is shortened so much um, where you might be only can fly an hour or that. So, you know, having your pre-flight check checks going and being efficient at that. So you can, you can capitalize on that whole window um, is really important. Um, my current aircraft, the EB, at 95 degrees, we don't fly. Anything past 95 degrees, we don't fly. Well, how high is the sun at 95 degrees in the middle of July? So, you know, we have to have that, that nice sun angle. Um, so we're not getting the shadows and so forth. So we have to do that. As many of you know, we've had a couple hawk attacks, especially on our fixed wing, um, managing and avoiding that. Um, being careful, making sure we're noticing um, nest and stuff. When is nesting season for different um, uh, raptors and different birds? Um, which birds are aggressive for their territory? Knowing that um, and knowing what to do when that happens. What is your a mitigation plan? Um, what is your mitigation plan for that incident? Having that rehearsed, having that documented, having that as a SOP has been huge for us. Understanding the results, you know, why, when you process your data, why are you getting this error? Um, could you track it back? Um, we have certain procedures and certain checklists on our, our we use PIX4D, um, but drone to map and I believe Agisoft all give similar quality reports. Learn and, and learn how to read those and interpret it those quality reports. Um, they will help tremendously in the post-processing and avoiding um, future issues. We, um, we all know a drone collects a tremendous amount of data um, very quickly, but it's not perfect. Um, for us on the engineering side, especially man-made objects, the top right is a drone, and you can see the DSM, the, the surface we're getting. Um, it does not like sharp angles, and, and those, those really tight angles. Um, so we, we've supplemented and, and, and combined mobile LIDAR, which is on the um, bottom right. It's getting that nice, crisp LIDAR uh, point cloud, and under the vegetation, we're getting that, that data. 
Um, and on the left of the, um, is the combined data. So we're combining the aerial drone imagery and all the photo uh, photography we're getting from that that's supplementing it on areas that we know the drone isn't its best. And, and we're combining those. Um, it, it, it has been tremendously successful on our, our engineering side of, of our program. So we are, we are currently reorganizing um, and figuring out how we can support these new offices, all sectors, um, we're still not sure yet, but we're, we're starting the process. So we're looking at the whole program and, and seeing where we can improve and being honest with ourselves and seeing what didn't work and what works. Um, so EBE has been amazing. We're at 145 takeoffs and not so soft landings on this airframe. Um, it's been such a great aircraft. Covers a large area, multiple options on payload. So we have um, both our RGB camera um, that we can do um, landscape or portrait. So if we're doing a utility corridor, we can switch that camera around and be more efficient on our flights, less flight lines, um, because we're, we're collecting um, a, a portrait image instead of a landscape image. We have our Sequoia multispectral for our, our vegetation analysis on a lot of our long our long term mitigation programs. It does require more training um, than our other aircraft. Um, it's it's expensive. It's more expensive than our Phantom, and it's more stressful. Um, you only have to be really good at launching it. That's um, after you set the mission planning, you, you toss it. That's the only thing you can control once that motor turns on is that, that toss, unless you tell it to come back and land. Um, but you have to have a, de a, a landing spot. You have to pick your landing spot. You have to pick your path to land. Um, it's not like a multi-rotor where you just come down on one spot. So it is more stressful um, flying. Our Phantom is our workhorse. And this really surprised me. We've used the Phantom probably three to one over our EV. Um, I, I didn't think we were gonna fly as many projects with the Phantom as we do. Um, a lot of this is, is uh, marketing and videos and, and trying to depict um, the landscape or the setting to clients or to agencies. Um, so we do a lot of that which really surprised me. It requires less training. Um, people are more familiar with this product. The DJI products are the go-to for recreational users, at least in, in, in our, our community or our employees that have drones. Um, I, think, I don't think anyone else has any other brand. Um, it's definitely less expensive, um, but it's a single option payload. Um, unless you use third-party attachments and so forth. And a lot of our clients restrict that. Um, so we, we don't, we don't um, put any other payload on our Phantom. Do we need to add to our fleet? Yes. Um, we might get to a point where we treat the aircraft has another tune off toolbox where um, any, any group in, within Westland has ability to utilize this tool. Uh, so that's how we're looking at reorganizing the Westland UIS program. Turn the subject experts into pilots instead of the other way around. Um, this is kind of turning 180 degrees. When we first started the program, we, we picked very specific people to fly. Um, and they either came out of the GIS group or the survey group. And we said, these are our pilots, which turned, which is great for the first couple of years. But we spent more time training those pilots what 
the other groups we're looking for. When a cultural resource comes up and, and they want to get some oblique pictures of, of rock shelters or, or pit houses or a botanist, I want to go in and identify these type of plants. Well, we had to train them on what those were, what type of plants they were, you know, what were the archaeologists looking for. So now we're looking at identifying people within those sectors and training them to be pilots. So um, our first step is we're, we're currently meeting with each sector and each location and, and, and reintroducing um, the technology and the current tools. Um, and we're also meeting with key leadership at the company and identifying our needs and our wants. Oh, what has surprised me, um, like I said, is the phantom, our workers. That really surprised me. And, and, and the usefulness of known photography um, is really huge when we're trying to get those kind of marketing shots, those oblique shots that are, are, are standalone um, illustrations or, or pictures and reports. Um, we want someone that are interested in photography in the US and also accept new technology. And, and most importantly, even temper personality. Um, it, it, when you're flying, things can go wrong and we wanna make sure you're, you're even killed and you understand the procedures and, and our SOPs. So um, those are kind of the traits we're looking for. Um, we want at least one Phantom Four at each office. Um, and probably more, um, but uh, right now a minimum of one Phantom um, um, Pro uh, Four at each office. Um, we're looking at this, uh, the Phantom Four multispectral. Um, like I said, um, our Phantom is a single payload um, and we do, um, if we're flying the EV, I would say it's about two times um, to one that we're flying with our multispectral imagers. Um, so if we get another multispectral um, aircraft, um, we're looking at this one. Um, it's easier to train um, uh, as the DJI is widely used by both professionals and recreation users. Um, we have a lot of um, environmental and cultural resource staff that have DJI drones, the Mavic, um, and the Phantom series. Um, it, it's, it's more flexible and rugged terrain um, where we fly uh, yearly, twice a year, we're flying uh, uh, down Mineral Creek and Devil's Canyon outside Superior um, on the rims. They are not, they do not have a nice grassy landing zone. We're landing in the desert and it is um, pretty, um, pretty rough landings. Um, so having the ability to fly a, 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 a multi-rotor um, where we can throw it in a backpack and, and hike the rim and take off anywhere, um, it will add more flights, um, but we believe it will be safer and um, more efficient. Um, it's easier to carry in the field. We can throw it in a backpack. Uh, our our fixed wing um, comes with a large case. It needs a computer. Um, and all that. So um, the other ability too is, is to collect data in a timely fashion. Um, when we fly, uh, we have to schedule it out. Oh, it takes us, you know, a couple hours to get to the site. We fly for an hour. We drive back and so forth. If this was in in someone's backpack or in someone's vehicle, um, doing a, a native plan inventory, they can go up fly it in that, that same hour, maybe a little longer because it's a, it's a multi-rotor in that two hours, um, that still saves time and more efficient. They can collect the data the same day they're filled collecting. Um, so it gives us that ability. The other nice thing on this one, it, it's similar to the, the Sequoia. It has a sunshine sensor. It has those individual bands. This one includes the blue band, which um, I love the green drone uh, presentation at the uh, fly in. 
um, is the blue band has been very helpful in invasive species in other plant identification or classification. So having that, it's that single blue band um, will help us in the future. Uh, with the Socolia, you don't have that blue band. You get um, red, green, near infrared, and red edge. Um, so this adds an extra band um, on it. So our current status. So we do have budget approval for new aircraft. Uh, we're currently developing new um, training SOP with an increased focus on flying for video and still photos, just general photography and um, other apps that were looked at that um, um, other um, people have used um, for their videos, um, especially on the video side. Um, the other thing that, um, that we've adjusted is our stringent restrictions on weather, time of flight, Total hours of work a week, um, including driving time, logging maintenance and incidents. Um, um, trying to get rid of that gray area. Um, it's already stressful enough flying. Um, but let's, let's restrict those areas uh, and make it less stressful on the, the pilot. Um, so we're trying to do that. Um, the logging and maintenance and incidents, um, we get audited every year. Um, by a third party um, for our clients. Um, and the one thing we got dinged on um, last year was not recording when we uh, logging, when we re replace rubber bands um, on, our, on our aircraft. So we log, we have a, a more strict logging um, of our maintenance than any incident. Um, in meeting, we're, like I said, we're currently meeting um, with um, location leadership to get them up to speed for current tools. These are new employees um, and they're not familiar with us and our tools. Um, and we currently identified three biologists that we have started training with. That's what I have. Um, um, so any questions? Thanks, Chuck. There are no questions from the group. You have been incredibly thorough. I do have, I have a question though. I mean, even though I'm not in the group, uh, but I do have a question for you, Chuck. Yes. Um, and before you, you ask have, for or Casey, I destroyed all other videos of me crashing. Okay. <laughs> you know, I always love that, but um, just your logging methods, for your, um, for your, um, like, how do you log your um, use of, um, methods? Is it something where yes. you use the software, or is it something on spreadsheets? What's what method do you use to, you know, keep a record of your maintenance? Or like you said, you got dinged on your your um, changing rubber bands on your um, uh, EV. EV. So how, how do you log that now? Yeah, so we use Survey123. We've created a custom checklist for each aircraft. Um, we have an in-office, um, uh, in-office, a pre-flight, um, flight, and post-flight um, Survey123 form um, that we log everything in. Um, and when we replace a part, um, be it a rubber band, a propeller, a wing, or we add tape to our aircraft, um, we take a picture um, and attach it to that record. Well, I gotta say, I love that you're using Survey One Two Three. Um, I, I think that's awesome, uh, especially because if you're a member of AZGO, you can get that for free. So I just want to just add that in there. But thank you for answering that question. Yeah. For me. So, and, and that helps us with our, um, that form, we have all our flight hours per flight, our batteries, what batteries are used when they're charged and all that. Um, and, and that's all in a reporting a mechanism um, export that we've, we've designed um, to meet our, our third party um, safety assessment we do each year. Awesome, thank you. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, uh, Jenna, there's another question that came through. 
There is. Oh, there it is. That's great. If possible, it would be awesome to see the, the survey one, two, three forms, Chuck. Uh, this is from Benjamin Coker. He is in Pinal County. Um, his team is trying to figure out a good method of logging all of those yeah. things. Definitely. Um, um, he can reach out to me and I can send him some snapshots or if he wants to talk, um, feel free um, to reach out to me and we can connect. That's awesome. Yeah, and I can I can help the two of you connect too. So mm -hmm. is there anything else, guys, before we give you five minutes back, I think, four minutes back? Looks like looks like we're in pretty good shape. So thank you both very, very much. Um, you did an excellent job. I would encourage the folks that have joined us to take our survey. It's off in the right-hand side of your screen and come back this afternoon for the UAS Special Interest Group Session 2. We'll be starting at 3.30. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Chuck. Are we still live? Uh, yes.